Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Bunky Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Uh, on behalf of all my partners here at the Bunky Clinic, I'd like to welcome um, Professor Andres Rodriguez Lorenzo um, from Uppsala, Sweden. Um, Andres um, has become a very dear friend over the last couple of years. Um, he is the Chief of Plastic Surgery in the Department of Plastic and Maxillofacial Surgery at Uppsala University Hospital, which is just outside of uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Um, just a, a few points on um, Andres's background. He's, as I mentioned, Chief of Plastic Surgery currently um, at Uppsala. He's also the Director of the International Fellowship <clears throat> Program in Reconstructive Microsurgery, and he's been the Director of Microsurgery. He was that for five years from 2012 to 2017. He is an editorial board member for the European Journal of Plastic Surgery, as well as the Annals of Plastic Surgery. Um, he is originally from Spain, uh, but has been in, in Sweden now for, for a num number of years, and he obtained his MD and his PhD um, uh, from uh, the University of Santiago de Compostela, and then the PhD from the U University de, de Coruña. Um, his research interests um, and his, and his um, and clinical interests are in uh, facial and head neck reconstruction, including facial paralysis, um, head neck recon, face transplantation, and free tissue transfer. And tonight, or to this morning rather, he'll be discussing uh, endoscopic insetting of free flaps for skull base reconstruction. Um, as I mentioned yesterday when we were hosting uh, Professor Stefan Hoffer from the University of Toronto, um, I got to know um, Andres quite well during the Patagonia microsurgery meeting, which was the first meeting that we had in Patagonia. We were hoping to have it this year as well, but unfortunately it got postponed. Um, a lot of um, really great surgeons and great friends um, here, and Andres is actually standing right there, um, pretty much behind me. And it was a fantastic meeting and, a lo and an amazing location, um, and really a, a lot of attendees from all over South America, um, combination of lectures and cadaver labs. And so it was really a, 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 a fun time to, to spend with uh, friends and also make new friends. And, and here's a picture of Andres uh, getting ready to enjoy some delicious <laughs> Patagonian lamb. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know about you, Andres, but I know that I can't wait to go back. And I was really upset that this year got postponed. So yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully next year uh, there won't be any riots like there were this this year. Um, so with that, Andres, thank you so much again for being with us. It's really an honor to have you, and we're really looking forward to hearing your um, talk. I'm going to make you a presenter now. Yeah, thank so you, you very much. Desktop, of course. Let me see. And I'd like to ask everyone to keep your webcams and your microphones off uh, so that we can focus on uh, address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Babak. This is uh, really my honor and pleasure to give this talk. I'm uh, really uh, looking forward also to meet you again in person in Patagonia, maybe, or maybe in Hawaii next year. Uh, thank you. This is this is fantastic initiative uh, for all the micro all, all over the world. So I. Uh, I will talk about this uh, topic, endoscopic insetic of free flaps in anterior skull base reconstruction. Uh, and basically, uh, it's mostly like a technical talk, uh, so about surgical uh, aspects of, uh, of this, but also reflects a little bit of the last 10 years of uh, in our unit to reconstruction skull base or anterior skull base and how we've been developing from intracranial free flaps to endoscopic free flaps and uh, some tips and tricks on this uh, evolution. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, I, I, I work and live in Uppsala, which is a academic city, which is north uh, to Stockholm in Sweden, is uh, quite known because mostly his uh, university and the cathedral. Uh, this is what is famous of. Here you see also the castle of Uppsala and I welcome you to visit after this pandemic is, is over to visit Uppsala. Uh, the university is the oldest in Scandinavia, uh, is uh, quite well known, is a number of Nobel laureates from Uppsala University over the years. This is two uh, main uh, celebrities from uh, the university under Celsius that developed the, the scale of the grid Celsius and Carl Linnaeus, that was the, one of the most uh, prominent scientists in the 18th century, that developed the, the name of the plants. And this is some pictures of the university here in Uppsala. And something that is interesting, maybe, of you is that what is actually uh, Uppsala 
contribution to microsurgery and plastic surgery. So there are two examples here, two names, uh, Kalol of Nilen, which is, uh, was an uh, ENT, and was actually the first one using a microscope in the OR and uh, use, uh, operating a uh, autosclerosis. And so that was in 1921. So actually he started off a little bit the world of microsurgery, not particularly in reconstructive microsurgery, but in general to use a microscope in the OR. And then Torskuk, which was um, the consider, is considered the father of plastic surgery in Scandinavia, he was the founder of our department in Uppsala in 1951, and uh, Torskog uh, was a pioneer at that time. And uh, he did a number of studies on different areas, including cleft lip and palate, hand surgery, like Dupuytren was a very famous study on Dupuytren at that time, burn surgery, or it was the modern uh, development of the facelift by using this mask to actually applicate the, the uh, in facelift. We tried to have this legacy and maintain this legacy and spirit in Dr. Cook here in Uppsala. And therefore, we continue with these international connections and trying to be open and have maintained the friendship to look for excellence. And we have a fellowship in microsurgery also here in, in Sweden, which is uh, quite relatively unique for Scandinavia. And also we have this school, visit school visiting professor uh, that we have every year. Hopefully we can get some from bank clinic here in Uppsala in the future. So I will talk about this anterior skull base uh, and how to reconstruct or, or our approach to anterior skull base reconstruction. And anterior skull base is really like a non-man's land because it's approached by different specialties, mostly neurosurgery and ENT, and it's a, bar a natural barrier between the brain and the nose. And uh, tumors that actually grow in this area uh, potentially have may have uh, lethal complications in form of communication between the nose and the and the brain and infections that can be can be lethal so this uh, natural barrier is is what called anterior skull base and separates the, the brain from the nose as i mentioned but also um, separates the nose from, from the brain from, from the orbits, from the, from the eyes. And in particular, uh, we, plastic surgeons and reconstructive microsurgeons, we are involved in different parts of the body and offer a, a consulted by, in this area, by uh, neurosurgeons or uh, ENT surgeons that actually see this area in different perspectives. So usually neurosurgeons will call these intracranial tumors that grows down and, and ENT surgeons will say that it's sinonasal tumors that actually grow up through the anterior skull base. So these areas are called no man's area or it's area that many people are involved or work around. It creates a really fields that are true multidisciplinary. And we as reconstructive surgeons are very comfortable in these new fields of fields that are evolving. And basically when many people are around a problem and working together, usually is when it comes uh, innov innovative solutions and um, new solutions that benefits the patients. So the reconstruction goals that we have after anterior, anterior skull base resections, usually what we want is to support the brain um, from, from the eye to avoid pulsatile uh, eyeballs after uh, after resection on the sc skull base, you want to separate the uh, the brain from the from the nose and the and the nasopharynx and the oral cavity to avoid contamination. And eventually, you all you want also to restore the three dimensional appearance of the face and the head and neck uh, if bone and soft tissue are resected externally. So in general, the reconstruction alternatives uh, can, can go from, from non-vascularized graft to vascularized uh, local flaps or free flaps. In general, small defects are managed with local flaps or non-vascularized graft. You can see in, uh, in the literature, mostly from ENT or neurosurgical literature, the, one of the standard uh, local flaps used are the gallial pericranial flaps. Um, or you can use flaps from the septum of the nose that you can swing up uh, and close small defects. 
And there are also literature showing that using uh, fat graphs for very small defects to really uh, try to close defects and about, uh, avoid uh, leaking, leakage from, from the brain. What happened is that if you have larger defect on the anterior skull base, and particularly if you, if you expect also radiotherapy afterwards, uh, local flaps or non-vascularized uh, grafts will not really solve the problems and you have high rate of leakage, uh, CSF leakage and uh, contamination of the brain. Therefore, uh, providing free vascularized tissue is uh, one of the main options to solve these problems. And, and our institution, we use that, the ALT, uh, in different design and combinations as a first choice in these large defects. But you need to consider a number of things in skull base is what I call the, the reconstructed triangle in anterior skull base. And you need to think about uh, the potential defect, uh, which approach will be used to resect this tumor and how you will insect the flap. What is different from other parts of the body is the approach to, to the defect uh, will actually make uh, challenging actually the insetting of the flap. And you need to think all these three components to make a successful reconstruction of the anterior skull base. So I will try to break down a little bit these three uh, concepts to make it as pedagogic as possible. So starting from the approach. Uh, so the approach to the skull base, and here I have a skull with me, a 3D printed skull, um, so the skull base, you can approach it through through the nose endoscopically or transcranially, right? So the traditional approach is using a transcranial open and based on uh, craniofacial principles uh, that were um, uh, initiated by Paul Tessier in France. So basically through craniectomies, you will approach the anterior skull base to resect your tumor. You can do also another approach, which is has been a, a very popular the last 15 years, which is endoscopically through the nose or transoral, where you can resect tumors from below. So you can approach the skull base from, from the nose or through, through the mouth to reach uh, the anterior skull base. You can do a combination of approach in case the tumor is um, extend intracranially, and then you need to combine the endoscopic transnasal approach with a transcranial through transcraniectomy to really make as good margins as possible in the resection. Uh, so we know the natural evolution of surgery is to minimize the morbidity of the approaches. So endoscopic surgery is growing in many fields and skull base has been um, very popular in the last 10 years and in, in many centers is uh, the standard of care uh, to resect tumors. And in that regards, we as reconstructive microsurgeons need to catch up with this technology and need to actually try to use our vascularized tissues uh, to use in this kind of minimally invasive approaches. So for example, we have here an, uh, a visual of a successful endoscopic resection of uh, um, uh, mucosal melanoma in anterior skull base, as you see here, that was purely reconstructed with endoscopic inset of a free flap. The traditional approach will be doing uh, cranectomies and, and uh, to insert the flap. And I will develop this a bit more in a, in a minute. So we have the approach how to actually uh, go to the tumor that is uh, transcranial endoscopic or combined, and this is usually decided by the neurosurgeon or the ENT. And then we will come up with a defect, and the defect in the anterior skull base can be as complex as uh, uh, you want, and in general can be classified as central defects, which is actually the area of right on top of the nose, the ethmoidal area. You may have lateral defects, which is uh, the floor, the roof of the orbit. And in that particular case, usually the question is, the eye will be enucleated or not? Or you can have a combination of the central and lateral in combination with many other structures that can increase the complexity as much as you want, including the nose, the maxilla, the external skin, and so on. 
So this particular talk uh, is focused just in central defects, and there the majority of the defects we treat, and is and I will focus in just central defects affecting right, right the ethmoidal area. I can develop more another day, maybe uh, uh, central lateral or complex, including maxilla. But just to to emphasize today, just in the central and defect on the scal anterior scal base. So we talk about the approach, we talk about the defect, and uh, and then we talk about the other component of this triangle that I mentioned, which is the flapping setting. So when we have large defects in the anterior scalp base, you need to produce vascularized flap to seal properly the, the brain. So it's not communication between the brain and the nose. So you can insert your flap through a transcranial approach that where the brain uh, the brain is exposed, the craniectomies are done, so you can put your flap through that approach. It's called intracranial insetting, and you will have intracranial flap. Of course, you need to leave a part of the bone uh, open, a craniectomy, to put out your pedicle uh, to to connect your anastomosis, typically to the temporal vessels. You may have another insetting, which is the one that we develop um, in our clinic. Uh, together with our colleagues from ENT, which is the endoscopic insetting that we started in 2016. Uh, and that you will insert your flap through the maxilla. Uh, and I will show you in a minute some examples, making a hole in the anterior wall of the maxilla and plugging the flap through the nose towards up to the skull base. And finally, you can combine, you can do endoscopic insetting with combination with an open approach if the craniectomies are done. So I will show examples of these three type of insetting. So the difference from here, transoral or endoscopic assisted or intracranial, on the left side, you see a, a typical transoral approach, how it looks like. So this is, we need to do a anterior um, a resection on the anterior wall of the, of the maxilla, preserving the, the teeth uh, and presenting the, the height and the projection of the maxilla, but that that will allow you to put the flap in the skull base, and you typically the vessels will connect it to the facial vessels, and then on 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 your right it will be a intracranial flap with intracranial insetting after craniectomy of the tumor. We will put the flap uh, right under the brain to obliterate the nose and and the brain. And the pedicle will come out through a small hole that will leave in the scalp towards the temporal vessels for anastomosis. So some examples of these three different approaches. Uh, the transcranial approach uh, with intracranial insetting of free flap. Uh, this is an example. This is a 46 years old woman with an olfactory neuroblastoma. You see here in the in the in the middle of the of the nose that actually infiltrates the dura, so it was decided to to do a, a transcranial approach to the, resect this this tumor and resect the dura, and eventually reconstruct the dura. And the plan was to do a free flap to seal the skull base and do the insetil intracranially. This is an image after the resection of the tumor. So this is uh, you see in the the, the patient from above, the bicoronal flap is, uh, is towards the upper part of the screen uh, with my pointer and, and you see the eyes and bulbs. And here in the middle is the resection of the ethmoidal area where the tumor was. And here is the brain and the, the dura reconstruction with the dura patch before the flap is inset. So in these uh, particular cases, when we do intracranial flaps, uh, usually the flap, the ALT flap, will be designed as a chimeric flap with a long adipofascial component to reinforce the dura. This will be lying on, to, on top of the, under the brain. And then we have a small uh, muscle component from the vastus lateralis to seal the, the ethmoidal and the central area on top of the nose. So these two components allows us to seal properly the brain. And then the pedicle will go out from, from the hole laterally in the parietal area towards the temporal vessels. This is a, a representation of it. I put a drawing of the vessels how it will be connected to the temporal vessels. And as you see, the craniectomies are quite, quite extensive, especially 
you have the, the frontal cranectomy that the neurosurgeons will do, but also in the orbital rim are actually removed to actually reach properly to the tumor in the, no, in the nose component. Component. This was well, our approach until 2016. And this is uh, a much two years follow up of this patient, it's, it's seven years now follow up with, with our re recurrence. And this is more or less representation where the flap is. I put it in my uh, dot there. So it's isolating uh, the brain from, from the nose. Another example, and actually this was the case that actually in 2016 we switched from intracranial to, to uh, endoscopic insetting, uh, mostly based on a complication of this particular case. So this is a 20 year old male with a large sinonasal cancer, as you see here. Um, it's a very large tumor that was planned for uh, intracranial um, Resection, uh, transcranial resection in the same fa fashion as the previous case. Uh, here you see the bicoronal flap again uh, towards uh, the upper part of the screen and the defect with the large defect, all the anterior skull base, especially in the central part is gone and big dura defect that is reconstructed with the dura patch. And then using this chimeric ALT with the muscle components to obliter obliterate the ethmoidal area and then adipofascial components to seal the, the brain. Uh, and then finally, the pedicle will go to the temporal vessels to, to do the anastomosis. So we do extracranial anastomosis to the STA. And you see always we, you need to leave a, some small defect in the crania, in the craniectomy to not compress your pedicle. The problem is like postoperatively, they three, four start doing a, a uh, massive pneumoencephalus and uh, and with a CSF leak. As you see here, when I write gap, there is, we didn't seal properly the skull base. That means that actually the, every time he will breathe, the air will go in in the skull and will not go out as a valsalva maneuver. And that increased pressure in the brain. So we need to, we needed to seal this gap and we decide to actually approach this Instead of, instead of doing a new chronectomy, approach through the maxilla a new free flap. So we did a transoral uh, endoscopic insetting or a set con free flap, which is a, a bastus lateralis that we trim uh, accordingly to the defect. This is the intraoperative pictures. We dissect the facial belts in the neck. We make a tunnel in the cheek, and then we uh, remove the anterior part of the maxilla to actually could place our, our flap to actually be able to seal properly the skull base. And then we use the bastus lateralis that we trim properly and we very long pedicle. You, you need to reach from the, more or less from the uh, base of the nose to the neck, you, you need a, a, around 12 centimeters. So you need to base your bastus lateralis really, really distal using all the descending branch to really need, uh, reach the neck. Then we, this is image of the endoscopic in setting that we, we do uh, with our colleagues uh, from ENT with Dr. Stigare. This is the insetting of the flap through the mouth and connection to the, to the neck. And finally, we will monitor the flap with an invasive Doppler that we put in the, in the vein in the neck. And this is a endoscopic view, three weeks post-op. Uh, here you see the base of the of the floor of the nose here on the bottom, and the upper part uh, is the granulation in the muscle that usually takes six, seven weeks to actually mucosalize. And this is a, a, a tube that I usually put in the nose to avoid the collapse of the muscle. This is six months post-op. Uh, this is the first flap, the intracranial flap. Uh, this is an MRI, and then the second free flap that we did uh, with endoscopic insetting, and we achieved the um, the sealing of the of the leak this leakage. And, and now we have a four four years follow up with uh, uh, the patient's tumor free. So this case allows us to from 2016 to actually switch a bit our approach to the insetting of free flaps in the skull base using this endoscopic insetting uh, through uh, the maxilla and through the mouth. Uh, so, so 
in these cases that we have uh, just uh, resection with endoscope, we will provide seal of the brain with just endoscopic approach. And we published this in uh, uh, 2019, and I will show you some of a video about the technique. So usually, as I mentioned, we do a resect the anterior wall of the maxilla. We make a tunnel in the cheek to reach the, the facial vessels and we place a pen rose to actually tunnel the vessels when we move our bastus lateralis flap. And the ENT surgeons will do the resection through the nose and the maxilla. And if it's a big intracr intracranial component of the tumor, it will be a neurosurgeon doing a resection also through a bob. And our flap will be placed through the maxilla. This is a small video showing this. Um, we have using a number of flaps, including radial front flap, vastus lateralis, and adipofacial ALT. We may favor usually use the, um, the vastus lateralis. So usually we have the flap, we trim it properly. Usually you need at, uh, 13, 14 centimeter, centimeters of length by three, four centimeters in width of the flap and 12 centimeters of, of pedicle length. We tunnel this pedicle through the cheek to reach the facial vessels. And then we will, uh, we will uh, put the flap through the maxilla in the nose to be able to do the insetting with endoscopic uh, component. Our colleagues from ENT, uh, Dr. Stigare and Dr. Andan, that we collaborate very closely, they will do the insetting as you see here. And basically, what we want is to put the tip of the flap in the central sinus to be able to really seal uh, the anterior skull base. This flap will be fixed with uh, fibrin glue. Here's the, the flap insetting. You see at the bottom, you see the nasopharynx and the floor or the nose, and the flap is inset in the sphenoidal sinus here and fix with fibrin glue. So when the flap is in position, the anastomosis are made and the flap is maintaining position through packing with a compress of the, of the nose that is removed in two weeks. And we usually monitor the flap with an invasive Doppler in the vein. This is uh, how it looks like uh, about three weeks post-operatively. Again, this is the floor of the nose and you see the nasopharynx at the bottom of the image. And here you see the flap that has healed uh, nicely and towards the skull base, providing good sealing of the skull base. Some examples, uh, this is a 71 years old male with an olfactory neuroblastoma that you see here in the, in the imaging that was resected uh, completely endoscopically by our colleagues. And in this particular case, we decided to do an adipofacial ALT uh, to seal the uh, skull base. And you see the here in intraoperative pictures and we connect the vessels to, to the uh, facial vessels at the nasolabial fold, um, as you see here in the middle, and we put a invasive Doppler to control the flap perfusion. And on the right side is an imaging of the vascularized fascia sealing the skull base. On the left is a image two months of postoperatively of the CT, how it looks like, and one year post-op, patient is, is tumor free, is now, I believe, uh, three years follow-up. And you see a nice uh, scar uh, healing in the nasolabial fold. Uh, but sometimes the tumor is bigger than uh, uh, that cannot be resected purely endoscopic and needs to be combined a uh, transcranial approach with a, with a trans uh, nasal or transoral approach and this is the majority of the cases we have actually so the insetting we do is still endoscopically through the mouth uh, uh, through through the mouth that I just presented this is an example is 40 this is a 41 years old male with a large sinonasal adenocystic cancer that you see here with uh, infiltration of the dura that needed a combined um, transcranial endoscopic resection. So 
Again, the design will be a vastus lateralis muscle with a very long vascular pedicle, and you need to thin it quite a lot to actually fit in the defect and reach the sphenoidal area. As I mentioned, usually the dimensions are around uh, 13, 14 centimeters in length, three, four centimeters in width, and a pedicle length of about 12 centimeters. This is a in, in setting uh, using the, the transoral and the transcranial approach. We take advantage of this, so we plug the flap through the mouth, mouth and um, we can control uh, openly, and then the last part of the insetting, we will do it endoscopically. Here's how it looks like when we put the flap inside before we put also the pericarnial flap to seal better the, the skull base. And the last part of the insetting needs to be done with endoscope. And our colleagues uh, from ENT will do it and put the tip of the flap in the sphenoidal area to avoid uh, leakage. And this part cannot be really well seen openly. So the, really the posterior part uh, where the sphenoidal area is, is much better visualization through the nose. That's why this combined approach is uh, quite good to actually seal uh, well the skull base. This is uh, a video of this case, uh, three weeks postoperatively. You see how the flap is hanging on the top and it uh, start healing. You see some uh, granulation on the flap. On You see at the end, uh, this is the nasopharynx here and it's healing very nice and usually takes about six, seven weeks to, to heal completely. So we control the flap, uh, we monitor the flap with an invasive Doppler. Two weeks after we remove the tamponade, so um, to, to evaluate with uh, endoscope the visual, the, the viability of the flap, but usually we trust the, the invasive Doppler uh, to see that the flap is, is viable. So in summary, um, pre-flap uh, reconstruction uh, provides a reliable and robust uh, reconstruction of the of large defect of the anterior skull base. Mostly also it, it will be a combination of radiotherapy after the resection. The endoscopic insetting uh, is reliable and it aims to decrease the extent of the craniectomies. Um, when even when we have to combine intracranial approach, uh, the craniectomies are actually less extensive than before. We don't have to do a resection of the uh, orbital rim, and we don't leave um, a defect in the in the cranium that we did before for for um, for the leaving the pedicle out for the temporal vessels. It's uh, critical to have a a good collaboration with the uh, uh, ENT neurosurgery. I think this is a pure multidisciplinary surgical approach, and it, this is the key for success. Uh, in terms of endoscopic insetting, uh, we have a, uh, it's quite a big learning curve in terms of how measurements needs to be of the flap. If you do it too big, will obliterate completely the the nose. If you don't do it too long, it, it may you may have uh, leakage afterwards. So it needs a learning curve that needs to be together with an expert in endoscopic and a microsurgeon. And uh, hopefully we have published now some literature about it and that can help others to do it. And I think the versatility of the ALT, particularly the vastus lateralis, makes an ideal flap for for uh, skull base reconstruction as you can trim it, trim it quite as you want and you have a very long pedicle, uh, even 15, 16 centimeters if you really base this, the vastus lateralis really distally. And, and again, this is never a solo surgery. This is really a team approach. And I work with a fantastic uh, group of uh, colleagues, both in plastic, but also ENT surgeons. I need to mention Dr. Stiger and Dr. Lidian from ENT and uh, Dr. Good Johnson, Hasselager and Riedelforce from neurosurgery. That together we we uh, work in this uh, advanced skull-based cases to reconstruct and bring the best for the patients. And I would like to thank you again for this invitation, the opportunity, and I take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, for a, for a really interesting um, talk. I think I, I've heard a shorter version of this before, so really nice to see uh, more detail on this. <clears throat> I have a couple of questions. The first one is is with regards to your, to your comments about this being a multidisciplinary thing. I think most of us plastic surgeons and microsurgeons have um, no experience 
or very little experience with endoscopic procedures. Obviously, there's endoscopic carpal tunnel, endoscopic brow lift, which are very kind of uh, niche type procedures. Um, where, do, where do you suggest that we even start with this? I mean, obviously, our colleagues in ENT probably have a lot more experience with this. So is that how you learned from them? Are you are you now doing the insetting your, yourself, or is it are you doing it with the ENT surgeons? I'm trying to figure out where we would actually start to learn this. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very good question, and actually it's one of the key questions. I think uh, I don't do the, the insetting myself with endoscope, we do it together. So mostly I rely on the competence of my colleagues from ENT that do this every day in terms of resection of tumors. And I think the endoscopic insetting in the skull base because of the importance of the structures you, you have around. I mean, you have the carotids, you have a number of things that actually uh, have a very little room for for, for failure. So I think uh, I, I will advise to actually team up with a, with a colleague that does endoscopic resection of uh, skull-based tumors on a regular basis. And this is how we actually team up with our colleagues. And I can provide the best of microsurgery, I believe, and they provide the best of endoscopic uh, skull base. And that conjunction brings the best of for the patient, I think. So I think differently from endoscopic approaches in maybe other parts, like harvesting flap endoscopically or harvesting nerves, I think the endoscopic inset in or skull base, I think needs a specific competence, I believe. Yeah, I think those are really good points and they're well taken. <clears throat> now, it, it um, it's intuitive that with a, a, a more minimally invasive approach that the patient outcomes are better probably and the complication rates are less. Um, do you have any data to to show, for example, the complication rates or the or just the morbidity before when we're doing the kind of maximally invasive approach versus the endoscopic insetting of these things? Because it would make sense that the patients are probably having a lot less morbidity with this. Yeah, that is that is our our impression, but we don't have data yet. So we're starting <clears throat> starting a study now or reviewing the last ten years and try to sort of uh, have two cores of open versus close in setting and see the morbidity of that, mostly focusing the immediate uh, complications such as leakage, infections, and so on, but also in late, compli late related complications of cranectomies. Uh, but I don't have the data on that, but, but we are uh, working on, on a study of reviewing the last 10 years of, of that. We have just published a very preliminary uh, clinical uh, series of five patients using endoscopic insetting, and we have a rather high complication rate in terms of leakage uh, because usually it's large, too much receiving radiotherapy, and and I believe is also learning curve in that. So mm -hmm. we, as I mentioned, the size of the tumor of the of the size and dimensions of the flap is quite key because you need to reach from the, let's say, from the base of the nose all the way up to the sphenoidal sinus. And you have uh, whether too short muscle or, or too big, you will not be able to, to actually inset where you actually want. So we think now we manage to have this kind of uh, dimensions that actually are quite precise. So these 14 centimeters by four by 12, Actually, we have we are very happy how we are doing with it, with our cases with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are those are great points. You know, um, we've we've seen from other um, surgeons that uh, a an endoscopic or um, even robotic visualization um, of difficult insets actually makes the inset a lot easier and makes the visualization much better. Uh, Jesse Selber, for example, at MD Anderson has has used ro robotic surgery to uh, help with the inset in the oropharynx um, area, especially when the mandible is not split. And, and he's shown that it's actually much better, uh, much easier to visualize that. Um, do you do you see any role for robotics in the future um, in in what you're doing, or do you think the endoscopic approach is uh, basically meeting all your needs right now? Well, I. I don't know, really. That's the question. I think the robotic, absolutely. I think the key is what you mentioned: is visualization of the defect, the visualization of your flap to make the inset. Uh, I think probably the endoscopic will be enough for that. Uh, definitely, the robot, uh, as I see in head and neck, has potential for 
incentive to avoid this kind of massive approaches to just mm -hmm. to put your flap where you want. And I think probably the robot will have, for example, posterior uh, pharyngeal defects or really tongue of the base and maybe skull base, maybe uh, really uh, when you have approaches to, uh, really to the posterior part of the neck, uh, the robot could, could have room for that uh, in combination with endoscopic or just endoscopic alone, I don't know. But the key in these cases is to have technology to avoid these massive approaches to decrease the morbidity and head, get more visualization. Which technology will be the future? Probably the robot or probably just a more advanced endoscopic uh, uh, techniques. Great. Um, the last question that I had, uh, and then we'll open it up to any questions that may be in the comments section. Um, you showed the use of the ALT, for example, with the chimeric approach with um, uh, adipofascial flaps plus a segment of vastus. Um, are there any cases, or are you doing many cases that require bony reconstruction? And, and if so, um, what is your preferred bone? Uh, are you going with the traditional fibula? Are you using MFC? What are you using? And, and if so, um, is the endoscopic approach sufficient for you to achieve some kind of fixation with the bone if you need it? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, I didn't. I just focus in this talk in the central uh, defects, but when you have combined, as you mentioned, combined central and lateral defects, including bone, now the challenge is a bit higher. And usually uh, we do open approaches just to see the last piece of the flap in the sphenoidal sinus. We use the, the endoscopic approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, what we do with the bone, traditionally we don't do bone reconstruction if it's a very extensive tumor. So we leave the scalp unreconstruct until it's uh, clear of, of tumor. And then secondary will be probably a custom uh, craniectomy, uh, cranioplasty. Uh, we usually don't do vascularized bones uh, in these cases. Uh, we have done custom maze implants at the same time. So we did a case like a month ago, six weeks ago with a leiomyosarcoma that we actually did a custom maze implants of the, uh, it was part of the orbital roof, the cranion, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a customized implant plus a free flap. So in this particular area, uh, area of the body, usually we use customized implants, so uh, not really autologous vascularized bone differently from maxilla, mandible, or cervical spine, for example. Great, That's, those, are, those are huge cases. I um, uh, would love to see one of the, see a video of that at some point as well. Yeah. Well, Andres, thank you so much for um, honoring us with your talk. It was a really, really fascinating topic, um, and it really, I think, adds to our library because we haven't had anyone discuss anything even close to what you're discussing today. So thank you so much for that. Thank you and very much. We, for we had uh, almost 60 viewers from around the world, so definitely a lot of interest in this. Great, fantastic. Hope to see you soon in person. Bye -bye. Yes, hopefully, uh, for sure. And and for the viewers who are still on, um, for we'd like to welcome you back for tomorrow. We have two uh, two giants in extremity surgery. Uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. Pacific time, we have uh, Professor Bruno Battiston from Torino, Italy, uh, discussing the mangled lower limb. Um, so definitely a talk that you'd want to watch. And then at 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, we have Professor Sanghyun Wu from W Hospital in Daegu, South Korea, um, another giant uh, discussing his experience with venous flaps. So hope to see you then. Andres, thanks again. Great seeing you virtually, but hopefully we'll see you soon in person as well. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.